Hello everyone. So I hope you're staying dry and out of the storm. Um, I've posted this to uh, take the place of our lecture for tonight. It'll certainly be shorter than our three hour lecture. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure how to feel about doing this particular lecture remotely. Um, I guess we'll see how it goes. There's a quiz scheduled for next week, um, but I'm gonna keep that sort of loose. I wanna check in with everybody and make sure that all this stuff about proofs makes sense before I quiz you. So pencil in the quiz, but know that I'm, you know, I'm gonna be flexible on it. So <clears throat> today we're talking about proofs and deductive logic, right? This is our method of showing that an argument is valid. So <clears throat> we've already shown, we have a method for showing that a, argu a deductive argument is invalid, right? And that was the counterexample where you dream up a situation where the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. You can dream up that sort of situation, then it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false, right? Which means that it's not valid because the definition of validity is if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true, right? So counter example shows that that's not the case. But if you can't come up with a counter example, it doesn't necessarily for sure show that the argument is valid, right? It gives you a hint that maybe it is valid, but it's also possible you just, we just weren't clever enough to come up with the counter example. So now we're gonna have, we have all the building blocks um, to assess a deductive argument for validity. You already know how to break down the argument into premises and the conclusion, right? You can look at a paragraph of text or a conversation, figure out the conclusion, that's the thing that the person wants you to believe and then the premises are the reasons given, right? And once you find all those parts, then you can put them in a standard format. So you can the number the premises, one, two, three, however many there are, and then you know align and then the conclusion. You also now know how to translate those premises and conclusion into logical symbols, right? So you find the main operator, right? Change that to the symbol, break it down until the only English parts left are atomic statements, right? And then you assign a capital letter to each of those atomic statements. So we've done that in class. We've also covered the rules of inference, right? The only moves that you can make to go from one premise or set of premises to a conclusion that are logically valid, that we know won't produce a false conclusion if they're true. But with all those little building blocks, now we can uh, assess an argument for validity by doing a deductive proof. So <clears throat> notice with this method, right? So if we complete the proof, right? And we can show the conclusion follows from the premises using only valid rules of inference, it's definitely valid, right? Now, if you fail to do that, it's kind of the inverse of the counter example method, right? If I can't figure out how to prove this argument, show that it's valid, Maybe that means it's invalid, or maybe it means I just wasn't clever enough, right? So we need the combination of both those methods, right? To figure out if a argument is invalid or valid. But if you can prove it using only those few rules that I showed you, then uh, it's guaranteed to be valid, right? Now, what it means to prove it is all gonna be the point of this lecture. So I'm gonna try to walk you through it. I'll post some homework for you to practice. You know, feel free to reach out in the meantime. Now might be a good time to reach out, right? If between the lecture and the homework, you're still a little confused. That's natural. Um, students are often confused about new proofs. Feel free to reach out to me and, and we'll make sure that everybody gets it. So let's take an argument, break it all the way down, and then figure out whether it's valid. So here's an argument. If God exists, then God is all good and powerful. If God is all good and all powerful, then he would prevent evil. If evil exists, God does not prevent evil. Evil exists, therefore God does not exist. So this is a well-known uh, argument against the existence of God. It's uh, the well-known, the famous problem of evil, right? So again, there's two questions to whether this is a good argument, right? And whether we should believe the conclusion that God doesn't exist. First, we ask, is the argument valid? Then we ask, are the premises true, right? So first, let's just assess it for validity. Well, let's find the conclusion. Um, do we have any conclusion indicators, right? Sometimes there's words that tell us, here comes a conclusion. Words like, therefore, so, in conclusion is a nice, uh, obvious one. 
So here we do have one conclusion indicator. I see a therefore, right, in the last sentence. So that's a good hint that the conclusion is God does not exist. Right? We found the conclusion. Uh, what are the premises? Well, uh, you know, there's one, two, three, four sentences besides the conclusion. Uh, there's a good chance that each sentence is a premise. Right. So that would be four. We've got number one, just the first statement. If God exists, then God is all good and all powerful. Second statement, if God is all good and all powerful, he would prevent evil. Third statement, if evil exists, God does not prevent evil. And then evil. Exists. And as the last line, we'll put our conclusion. Therefore, God does not exist. So, you know, if you need to pause this video, look at that paragraph again and, and try to convince yourself that um, these, these five statements are the same argument that's presented in that paragraph. This one is fairly straightforward. Notice it's in the exact same order that occurs in the paragraph. We've got a nice sort of juicy conclusion indicator there. So it shouldn't be too difficult of a argument to, to put in the formal um, formula right here, right? So it's just each statement and then the conclusion. Okay, so next step, next step is to break down these statements and put them in logical notation. We have, if God exists, then God is all benevolent and powerful. If God is all benevolent and all powerful, then he would stop evil. If evil exists, God does not stop evil. For evil exists, therefore God does not exist. Here's how I would break down the first point, right? Look at the first premise. Is there uh, any logical words, right? And any commas that indicate that we where the main operator is? In premise one, we have a big comma after if God exists. Well, if tells us there's a conditional, right? We've got a comma and then a then. So this is a good clue that we're dealing with a conditional statement here, right? If God exists, the antecedent, or sorry, God exists is the antecedent. God is all benevolent and all powerful is the consequent, right? So let's change the if then to a conditional hook, right? So we've got, um, God exists, then God is all benevolent and all powerful. Now there are, there's another uh, logic word in there, the and, right? So we can change that to a dot. So that whole thing, God is all benevolent and all powerful, that is the consequent of the whole condition. Main operator is conditional, right? So we wanna put that second part in parentheses so we know that that dot, that and, is not the main operator, right? It's, um, it's just holding together the conjunction that is the consequent of that condition. So here's the, and then I have assigned, you know, uh, letter names to the remaining atomic statements. So God exists is G. God is all benevolent is B. God is all powerful is P, right? So look at the sentence number one, look at that trans translated version. Again, you know, convince yourself that that is the correct translation if you haven't on that reach out to me. So <clears throat> the second premise, also a conditional, right? So comma, right, is right before a then. We've got an if at the beginning of the statement. So it looks like the statement naturally breaks in half around an if and a then, which would mean that we're also dealing with a conditional here. So the antecedent, um, God, the part, you know, between the if and the comma, basically, God is all benevolent and all powerful. Well, that should be familiar, right? It shows up as the consequent of premise one. So we've got there, there on the left of the hook on premise two, B and P in parentheses, right? Because the and, the conjunction there is not the main operator. We already decided the main operator is a conditional. And then the consequent is he would stop evil. And I've gone ahead and symbolized that as an S. Again, I'm moving, if I'm moving a little more quickly than you're at personally for translating sentences, um, you know, feel free to pause this, take it, take it slow, ask me questions, ask questions of your classmates, um, and, and so on, right? Premise three, if evil exists, God does not stop evil. Again, we've got a conditional, right? We've got an if, We've got a comma, we don't have a then, but sometimes that's how English does it. We don't always include the then. 
but it looks nonetheless like a conditional where evil exists is the antecedent. So I'll symbolize that as E. And then the consequent is God does not stop evil. So that itself is a compound statement, right? It's a negation. So God stop, God stops evil or would stop evil. I'm symbolizing as S. And so the consequent of three is the negation of S. God does not stop evil. We've translated uh, the three premises there. Oh, sorry, there's a fourth premise, evil exists. That's already an atomic statement, right? There's no ands, no ifs. Call that E. We've already called it E in premise three, right? And then we have our conclusion, God does not exist. That is a negation, right? It's a compound statement. It's the negation of G, which we already have up there, God exists. So again, if that went a little fast for you, don't worry. Go back, work a little bit more with your translating sentences, and then come back. Okay, so we have taken the argument, we've made it, right, put it in order with the premises and the conclusion. Now we've translated those into logical notation. Now comes the time to decide whether this is a valid argument. So to prove that this is a valid argument, we have to be able to derive not G, the conclusion, from these four premises using only valid rules of inference. And remember, our valid rules of inference were modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, um, conjunction introduction, conjunction elimination, right? If those words sound confusing to you, go back and study your rules of inference, right? Um, this is a part of the class where you really do have to sometimes just sit down and memorize some stuff because I, I, I realize that this terminology comes fast and kind of compounds on top of each other. You have to remember what a conditional is, what's an antecedent, what's a consequent. Now all these Latin words, you know, there's not, there's only like four or five at each part that they build on each other. Um, so do take the time, don't let this, don't just let these words wash over you and say, oh, I don't really understand it, but maybe it'll be okay. It won't be okay, right? You have to take it slow. I'm happy to take it with you, reach out, we'll work through it, right? So again, we've got our valid rules of inference. So can we get from these four premises using only valid rules of inference to the conclusion, not G? Right, this is our problem. We need to strategize. So there's sort of two ways to go about this. You can just start with your premises and see what valid rules you can apply, right? Um, or you can start with the conclusion and try to work backwards and see, okay, what rules would get me to that conclusion? So for example, um, if you're familiar with your rules of inference, you might look at three and four and realize that that's an opportunity to use modus ponens, right? We've got a conditional line three, if E then not S. And then we've got on line four, the antecedent of that condition, we've got E, right? So modus ponens says we can derive on a new line, the statement not S, right? Um, got not S, then what do you do with not S? And you might recognize some opportunities to use rules there. That's one way is just look at the premises and, and use whatever rules you can. So the nice thing is um, you can do as many lines as you want and maybe you try some stuff and it doesn't end up actually being helpful. That's fine as long as the moves are valid try as many things as you want, right? So maybe look at three and four, say, oh, I could do a modus ponens. I don't know how that's gonna help get me to not G, right? All it's gonna get is not S on another line, but we could try it. But if you wanna strategize, sometimes it helps to work backwards, right? So the conclusion is not G, and that's a misprint there. It should be not G. Um, not G doesn't appear in any of the premises, right? But G appears in premise one, right? So G appears as the antecedent of a conditional, right? Um, and we'd like to somehow derive not G. So we do have a rule that will give us the negation of the antecedent of a conditional. That rule is modus tollens, right? So if I have not B and P, right? So that whole B and P in parentheses negated. If I had that and line one, I could drive not G with modus tall, right? So I would need this, I would need not B and P. 
Now, I don't have not BNP in any of my premises, but I do have BNP on line two, right? But it's not negated. But notice again, modus tollens would also get me that if I had the negation of the consequent, if I had not S, right? <clears throat> so again, I need not S. If I had not S, I could do modus tollens with line two, which would spit out not B and P. And I could do modus tollens with line one, which would spit out not G, and then I'd be done. But how would I get not S? Well, we just noticed that three and four would get us not S with modus ponens, right? Um, I don't know if I'm going to walk you through it, right? So that's the strategy. Maybe it didn't quite make sense to you, right? Because maybe you're not super familiar with modus tollens. You need to get yourself familiar. With it. But here's what it's going to look like solving this now. So again, we've got our four premises and we've got the conclusion we're trying to get. From. First thing we're going to do is take line three and line four and derive not S. So, right, if you are solving this on an exam, this is it doesn't have to look like this, right? You can try lots of different things and it can come in any order as long as you get to the answer. But here's one way that a correct proof would look. You write on line five, so you're adding a new line now, line five, and you're putting not S on it, right? How? What gives me the right to put not S on that line? Well, it's because I had line three and line four, right? And I know that modus ponens says, if I've got a conditional on one line, and I've got the antecedent of that conditional on the other line, in this case E, then I can derive, I can put on a new line, the consequent, not S, right? So three and four with modus ponens gives me not S. Again, it's as if, if line three was, if it rains, the streets will get wet, and line four was, it's raining, I could conclude on another line, the streets will get wet, what modus ponens does. So I've made one move, I've gotten not S. On a quiz, that gets you points, right? I'll give you partial credit all day long if you can make any valid moves. Let's see if we can get all the way to not G, just using valid rules of inference. Well, we already strategized this, if you can remember. We wanted not S because we knew we could do a modus tollens with line two. Modus tollens says if you've got a conditional and you've got the negation of the consequent, then you can derive, i.e. you can put on a new line, the negation of the antecedent. So it's like, if it rains, the streets will get wet. The streets are not wet. Okay, I could write on another line, it did not rain, right? That's what we're gonna do here with lines five and two, right? So line two is a conditional. Line five is the negation of the consequent. I can write a new line and put the negation of the antecedent of line two. And I just have to write down which lines I'm using and which rule I'm using, which is modus tollens. So if you remember our strategy, we had one more modus tollens to do and we could get not G, right? Because we have line one, conditional, G is the antecedent, B and P is the consequent. We have the negation of the consequent on line six, not B and P. Modus tollens with line one and six will get us not G. So we've just solved, we've just proven this argument to be valid, right? We, starting with the premises, Using only valid rules of inference, we were able to derive the conclusion. We're going to practice this a few more times in this lecture. Right? If this was a little, little confusing, we'll keep trying it, and uh, I'm going to give you the homework to try it. We'll try it together in, in class as well before we do any quizzes. But uh, this is how it works. We've just proven this argument to be valid. Right? Now, does that mean God doesn't exist? Well. Right? No, we don't know that yet. We know the argument is valid, right? But to believe the conclusion, we also need to know that the premises are true, right? Um, and there are some premises that might be false. Uh, I can't go back a slide, but the, the premise that people typically think is false is the premise that says, um, if God is all good and all powerful, then he will prevent evil. And many people say, well, um, God does want free will to exist, right? And in order to allow free will to exist, people have to be free to do evil. And so it's not true that he's good and powerful means that he will prevent all evil. He will allow some evil to exist um, because humans will freely choose to do evil. Right? So even though it's a valid argument, uh, people have argued that 
it doesn't prove the non-existence of God because that one Another argument, right? Let's again translate it and then we'll um, see whether how it uses it. So here we have another argument. Look, either you're tough on crime or you're a communist. If you're a communist, then you're a traitor and you belong in jail. If you favor legalizing marijuana, you are not tough on crime. You said you favor legalizing marijuana, you belong in jail. So first we need to find the conclusion and find the premises. So what is this person trying to convince us of? Um, it's a little trickier. We don't have a, a therefore or a so, right? Um, but hopefully a little sort of like, you know, looking at the context, and the way the stuff moves, it seems like the conclusion is you belong in jail, right? That's what they're telling you. It, I mean, one conclusion, one helpful conclusion indicator sometimes is the last sentence, right? The conclusion is not always the last sentence, but if you don't have any other good indicators. That's a good place to look. So what are the premises? Either you're tough on crime or you're a communist. If you're a communist, then you're a traitor and you belong in jail. If you favor legalizing marijuana, you are not tough on crime. And you favor legalizing marijuana. So four premises. So <clears throat> here they are, the four premises in the conclusion. We need to translate them, right? So the first statement, um, what is the main operator here? Either you are tough on crime or you are a communist. Well, there's the only logic word in there. The only operator is or, disjunction, right? You are tough on crime is an atomic statement. You are communist, an atomic statement. So there's just one operator and that's the main operator. So we'll call you are tough on crime T, call you're a communist C. And so one is translated as T or C. All right, let's look at two. If you're a communist, comma, then you are a traitor and you belong in jail. Well, hopefully at this point you're used to if then separated by a comma, right? And you know that that is a, the main operator there is condition. So you look on two and, and the conditional, the hook, that is the main operator. The antecedent is you're a communist, uh, that's just C. And then the part after the then, the consequent, is you're a traitor and you belong in jail. So the consequent there is a conjunction. So we'll call you're a traitor R, and we'll call you belong in jail, right? So two is translated as if C, then R and J. Three, if you favor legalizing marijuana, you are not tough on crime. Again, right, looks like a conditional. Um, we got the if, we got a comma breaking up the sentence in two. We don't have the then this time, but sometimes you don't have it. Nonetheless, it's conditional. Uh, the antecedent part, the part between the if and the comma is you favor legalizing marijuana. That looks to be comic, right? I don't see any ands or um, ors in there. So we'll call that L. And then the consequent, the part after the comma, you are not tough on crime. Well, that is a compound statement because it has negation in it, right? So it's the negation of you are tough on crime. And we already said that that is T, right? So we have L then not T. And then finally, four is just an atomic statement. You favor legalizing marijuana. And uh, we already cited that one. And then you belong in jail, also an atomic statement uh, that we decided was J. Right. So uh, we've translated it right now. We just have to determine uh, whether it's a valid. So, again, task is the same. And we derive J, the conclusion from these four premises using only valid rules of inference. So, <clears throat> again, you can. There's many ways to approach it. Right? You can work from the conclusion backwards, or you can also just look at the premises. And once again, you might look at three and four and say, okay, that's a modus ponens. Sometimes modus ponens is kind of the easiest one to recognize. I have a conditional in three, and I have the antecedent of that conditional on four, right? So I could, on line five, put not T, the consequent of three, and say, oh, three, four modus ponens, right? Um, Maybe you don't know how that's going to get you to J, but it's a move you can make. It's a valid move. Collect the points, right? And um, maybe if you keep doing that, you'll um, figure out how it's going to work, right? So, for example, um, 
once you've got not t on the board, if you if you did that modus ponens, right? And I'm, right now I'm giving you a slightly different uh, um, strategy than what's written down there below the argument. So maybe just listen to me for the moment and ignore the text there. So I said, oh look, three four with a modus ponens would get us not t. Now if I add not t on line five, I could also do another move, disjunctive syllogism. If you remember that one, right? So line one, we have a disjunction t or c. And I, if I drive not t, then I've got the negation of one of those disjuncts, and I could conclude c, right? Um, I've got c, now I could do modus ponens with two, right? And spit out r and j. So um, there's lots of different ways you could do this, right? Let's, let's think about it another way. Let's think about it starting with j. Okay, I want to get to j. Let me look in the premises and see if j shows up anywhere, because likely that's the premise right, that I'll have to use to get there. Well. J only shows up in line two, right? Um, well, what could I do with line two? I don't know. If I had C, I could do modus ponens, and that would give me R and J on its own. Now, that would be interesting, right? Because conjunction elimination says if I've got a conjunction, I can derive either conjunct on its own. I could, if I could get R and J sitting on its own on a line, then I could get J with conjunction elimination. I'd be done. Well, how could I get C? Well, C only shows up in line one, right? Um, but we just saw if we could do a disjunctive syllogism and get rid of T, then we could get C on its own, right? And our two strategies are kind of starting to meet in the middle, right? We're starting to see how this is going to work. So um, let's do it here. So I were going to solve this, and this is not the only way to prove this. Many of you may validly derive j from these premises a different way but i would say okay on line five i would just do modus ponens with three and four right that lets me put not t on a line by itself now that i've got not t line five and line one i can do disjunctive syllogism and get c on its own on a line now that i've got c on its own i can do modus ponens with line two and get the conjunction r and j by itself on a line on seven right and now that I've got the conjunction R and J, I can do conjunction elimination, or I'm sorry, simplification is another word for the exact same um, rule of inference. Sometimes they have multiple names. Conjunction elimination, simplification, same thing. You take a conjunction and you can derive either conjunct. So on line seven, I have R and J, so I can write J on, by itself on line eight. Right. Um, so I've gotten to J using only valid rules of inference. Uh, so again, the argument is valid. So do we agree? Do you belong in jail? Maybe, or maybe one of the premises. Is there, right? um, but showing validity is halfway towards showing that it's a good argument. All right, another argument. Let's keep practicing this, right? Really, you already, you had all the parts of this, right, already. I'm just putting them together and just practicing over and over. And I think the key thing for most of you will be to actually memorize all the rules of inference. Sort of looking at them and saying, okay, I, yeah, I, I think I understand these, is typically not enough. Again, this is a, one of those things where it's a skill like learning to play guitar, right? I can tell you how to play a song, but if you sit down and drill it, it's not, you don't really understand it, right? It's, so just looking at the rules of inference is not going to be enough. We have to sort of use them so we really understand. All right, so this argument, uh, if you're guilty of speeding, I'll have to give you a ticket. If you're guilty, you will blink your eyes. You just blinked your eyes, so I have to give you a ticket. So is this a valid argument? Well, first, we've got to find the premises and the conclusion. Here we have a so, right? So is usually a conclusion indicator. So I think I have to give you a ticket is the conclusion. So the other statements are going to be the premises. So the argument looks something like this. Premise one, if you're guilty of speeding, I have to give you a ticket. Premise two, if you're guilty of speeding, you blink your eyes. Three, you blink your eyes. Um, therefore, uh, I have to give you a ticket. Let's translate it. Uh, this one is pretty simple, right? So the first is a conditional. It's an if, you know, you got a comma. And there's no more. Um, each, both the antecedent and the consequent are atomic statements. So you're guilty of speeding, call it S. I have to give you a ticket, call it T. Um, two, if you're guilty of speeding, you blink your eyes. Okay, very similar, right? It's a conditional antecedent, 
guilty of speeding, that's S. Consequent, you blink your eyes, let's call that B. And then premise three is you blink your eyes. Okay, and the conclusion is I have to give you a ticket. So we've translated it, right? Um, is it valid? Well, let's see. Can we use the valid rules of inference to get to T from these premises? Well, we see T is the consequent in line one, right? Um, if we had S, we could do modus ponens, right? Um, but I don't see S on any of these other lines, right? Um, S appears in line two as the antecedent of the conditional, right? Um, modus tollens will give us the antecedent, but it negates it, right? Um, and not S is, is not gonna help us, or at least it's not gonna, we can't use not S in a modus ponens with line one, right? And anyways, to do modus ponens with line two, we would need not B, and I don't have not B anywhere, right? Um, so, <clears throat> I don't see any moves I can make with these premises, right? So I can't do, for example, with two and three, I can't do modus ponens, right? Um, B is not the antecedent of line two, right? To do a modus ponens with line two, I'd need an S somewhere. And I can't do modus tollens either with two and three because I would need not B, right? So I don't see actually, and these are conditionals. Those are really the only two rules I can do with conditionals, right? I'm not gonna be doing a disjunctive syllogism because I would, need a disjunction. There's no disjunctions here at all. There's no conjunctions here at all. So I can't do a conjunction introduction or simplification. But I actually don't see any valid moves I can make here. Um, so it looks like I can't get to T. So maybe this argument is invalid, right? Um, again, we can't know for sure. Maybe I'm just not clever enough to see the moves I'm supposed to be making here, but it doesn't look valid to me. And if I wanted to try to dream up a counterexample, I could maybe show that it's invalid. Right. It's sort of what this argument does, right, is it affirms the consequent, which is a um, fallacy. Right. So it takes something like P then Q and then it gives you the consequent and tries to drive P. But that is not a valid form of inference. Right. That is affirming the consequent. Right. Because they say if you're guilty, you will blink. And they say you blinked. And they're trying to say from that you're guilty. But again, that is not modus ponens, that is not modus tollens, that is not a truth-preserving inference, that is a fallacy. All right, one last argument. Um, I love you, but if you vote for Jones, I don't love you. You voted for Jones, so Justin Bieber is better than the Beatles. Now on the face of it, that seems like a really weird argument, right? The conclusion seems to be, you know, we see a so there. So I'm guessing the conclusion is Justin Bieber is better than the Beatles but it has nothing to do with the premises at all, right? So you might think, well, that's obviously invalid. Um, but let's just practice it and try it. So I could translate, I love you, but if you vote for Jones, I don't love you, as line one here, L and if J, then not L. And then line two, J, you voted for Jones. And then the conclusion, so just mm -hmm. better than the Beatles. Um, <clears throat> well, I could get line three. So I could get that, from line one, I could get that, uh, conditional on its own, right? I can just simplify that uh, conjunction and just get the right conjunct. So I can get J then not L, and then with line two and three, modus ponens, I could get not L, right? And then simplification from line one, I could get L. Look, now I have a, I have both L and not L. Right? That's a little weird. It seems to be apparent, apparently this, I have a premise that says I love you and a premise that says I don't love you. And then, uh, oh, and I never taught you disjunction introduction. So don't worry about this. The point of this is I, I decided to simplify this and, and not give you all of the uh, the rules, right? So I didn't give you DI. Forget about DI, right? Forget about trying to prove this. But the point is because you have a contradiction in there because it's sort of hidden, right? But because both I love you and I don't love you are sort of secretly in this argument or can be derived validly, um, then kind of anything goes. If you have a contradiction in your argument, you can prove anything. So if you have I love you and I don't love you, you can you can actually prove Justin Bieber is better than the Beatles. So it's a valid argument, right? But it's it's a bad one because it's got contradiction. 
Um, but contradictions aren't always obvious. So if you can find a contradiction somewhere in the premises, um, that's another way to know that you're dealing with a very good argument. Right? Um, so this last slide was just a little, a little something extra. I wouldn't worry about it too much if it feels a little confusing, right? Um, but the point is contradiction. All right, trying to do the, the best I can on this rainy day when everything was canceled. I'm gonna touch base with you next week. Try to do the homework, try to do the readings. You know, there's, I posted supplemental uh, videos with Rick Grush also sort of teaching you uh, the same sort of thing of how to do these derivations. And feel free to reach out to me. I can schedule Zoom, you know, with folks. And I'm not gonna just run into class and throw a quiz at you, right? I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about some bit first. If we're even ready to do the quiz. Right? So do your best and I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. All right, see you then.